We have been teaching a sermon series entitled The Sower's Harvest, or we could entitle it The Intentional Harvest. And today we're going to talk about the law of multiplication. Everybody say the law of multiplication. Very good. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20, verse 34. Yes, you yourselves know that with these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. Verse 35. And I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. As we have said previously, Paul is making the distinction between those who live to get and those who live to give. The believer lives to give. God is going to bless us, but we are blessed to be a blessing. That's right. Giving is big in our heart. Giving is big in our heart because that's the pattern that Jesus showed us. God is a giver. For God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten Son. He gave the very best to us. We're, we're givers. Believers are givers because we are compassionate people. There are things that we come across in the world that we just cannot abide. And we feel that we just have to do something about it. And as our Lord was compassionate, we're compassionate. And so we are givers. Givers of our time and our talent and our treasure to relieve pain from other people's lives. We're also givers because the Bible has mandates, scriptural mandates that says that we are to give of the tithe, the offering, and the alm, that we are to be uh, observant of what Scripture has to say. But we're also givers because as people of faith, say, I am a person of faith. I am a person of faith. Persona de fe. Amen. That we are people of faith. Yes, we are. And as people of faith, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, we go back to what Scripture has to say about giving. And when you look at what Scripture has to say about giving, you see that giving is what releases your harvest. Hallelujah. I should have a really big amen right there. Yeah. Giving releases your harvest because the, the faith-filled believer understands three scriptural principles that govern giving in the life of the believer. Number one is the law of sowing and reaping. Number two is the law of multiplication. And number three is the law of partnership. Number one, the law of sowing and reaping. Number two, the law of multiplication. And number three, the law of partnership. Today we're going to talk about the law of multiplication. We've already talked about the law of sowing and reaping. The law of sowing and reaping simply says, what a man sows is what he will also reap. So number one in sowing and reaping, what you sow you will reap. Good and bad, but what you sow you will reap. It also says, when you sow determines when you reap. You will, you will not see your harvest come in until you get seed in the ground. So when you sow determines when you will reap. And then it also says, in what measure you sow is the measure in which you reap. If you sow a little, reap a little. Sow a lot, reap a lot. So the harvest is determined by the believer. If the believer says, I want to see a harvest, the believer is going to get seed in the ground. If the believer says, I want to see a big harvest, the believer is going to get big seed into the ground. If the believer says, I want to see a harvest of blessings, a harvest of love, a, a harvest, the believer determines, if I want to see that harvest, I know what seed I've got to sow. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's the law of sowing and reaping. Today we're going to talk about the law of multiplication. And the law of multiplication simply says, seeds only know how to do one thing. Multiply. That's the only assignment a seed has. Multiply. It's just waiting to get into the ground. The seed says, if you'll get me into the ground, good ground, if you'll get me into the ground, I will do my job. <laughs> which is multiply. That's the law of multiplication. And we got good scriptural foundation for it. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. Now he who supplies seed, that's God. Now he who supplies seed to the sower, that's me, that's you. 
and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So God gives us the seed, but God then multiplies it into a harvest. And the church said amen and amen. And then in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Y'all turn there for just a second. Hey, communion people in the back. We've opened that wall. I can hear you now. <laughs> hey, communion folks, I can hear you. Now I can't hear them anymore. It's good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless them. I'm just glad someone's willing to do the communion work. Thank God. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the sound of busy hands back there. Thank you, Jesus, for them. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. It says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Verse 14 saying, Surely goodness, well, I mean, he says, Surely blessings, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Let's look at verse 14 again and read it out loud with me. Saying, surely blessings, I will bless you. And multiplying, I will multiply you. So is God a blesser? Yes. Does God multiply his blessings? Yes. I said, does God multiply? Is God a multiplier? Is there a law of multiplication that you can apply to your life? Yes, there is. Multiplication is the process of taking one thing and making many things. Taking, taking something that is a single thing and producing multiple things. Now, there, there's many ways that you can grow. You can grow by addition. So if you have 10 things and you add another thing, now you have 11 things. It's not much more, but it's still more. Thank God for more. Amen. Or you can have multiplication. You can have uh, 10 things and multiply by 2. And now you've got 20 things. Praise the Lord. Amen. Or you can have super abundant growth, which is exponential growth, where you have 10 raised to the power of 10. <laughs> the faith folks are getting excited right now. <laughs> which, which simply means, in math terms, you have 10 things and you multiply times 10. Which now you've got 100 things, and you multiply times 10. Now you've got 1,000 things. You multiply times 10. Now you've got 10,000 things. Multiply times 10. Now you've got 100,000 things. Multiply times 10. Now you've got a million things. Super abundance. I said super abundance. Somebody's going to write into me and say, you got the math wrong on that, Pastor. <laughs> I hope I got it right. But superabundance simply says that there is no limit to what God wants to do in your life. He's the God of abundance. He's the God of more than enough. Now unto Him who abundantly, everybody say abundantly. My God does abundantly above and beyond all that I could ask or think. Ephesians 3 and 20, look at it with me real quickly. Now, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Everybody just say exceedingly abundantly. Exceedingly. Turn to your neighbor and say exceedingly abundantly. Exceedingly. Above all that we could ask or think according to the power that works in me. Listen, listen, if you're going to think, you might as well think big. I heard, I heard a father tell his daughter one time, you're going to think, so you might as well think big. I mean, you're going to think anyways, so you might as well think big. Well, God does abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Hallelujah. Praise God. Look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance. May have an abundance. I said may have an abundance. I said may have an abundance. Having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Why does God want you to be blessed? So you can be a blessing. That's what God told Abraham. 
In Genesis chapter 12, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. Why does God want us to be blessed? Because he wants us, according to 2 Corinthians 9, to have all sufficiency in all things that we may have an abundance for every good work. In other words, there's things, for us for, there's things that God wants us to do. There's work to do. I said there's work to do. And God wants us to have an abundance of have all sufficiency so we can get that work done. Praise the Lord. And then John 10 and 10. Devils comes to steal, kill, destroy. But I've come that you might have life and life more uh, abundantly. And we could go on. But the, the revelation by Scripture is that God is a giver of good gifts. That God's not withholding any good thing. That God is trying to get abundant blessings into our life. That God wants to bless you. Now, now, you can believe God for just the addition, or you can believe God for the multiplication, but, but why not believe Him for the superabundance? If that's His nature, why not believe Him? If He's Jehovah Jireh, our provider, why not believe Him? If He said, I'll provide all your needs according to my abundant riches and glory by Christ Jesus, let's believe Him for that. I said, let's believe Him for that. I mean, if you pull into McDonald's and go through the drive through window, they ask you, what size of blessing do you want? <laughs> do, do you, sir, you, fries? Yes. Do you want medium? You want large? Sir, I can supersize that for another 25 cents. Hey, where's your faith at? Super size, baby, super size. Bring it on, hallelujah. Well, you might not eat it all. I have some to give away. I said, I have some to give away. Glory to God. Yeah, somebody will always eat those McDonald fries. Nobody's going to turn down McDonald fries. <laughs> Glory to God. I used to take Debbie out on dates to McDonald's. I didn't have, I have too, too many resources back in the day. I took Debbie out on dates to McDonald's, and, and um, I, I, she'd get something, I'd get something, and she always, her fries were so much better than my fries, and so I would always eat some of her fries. Come on, husbands, you're with me on this, right? So I always reach over and get some fries, and, and never heard a peep out of her until the day after we were married. Um, <laughs> man. The day after you're married, you get some revelation. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> we're, we're headed out on the honeymoon. Come on. And, and we pull into McDonald's as we're heading to our, our destination. And, and so she, she gets some fries. And, and uh, this is what I hear her say. She says, do you want some fries? I said, you bet I do. She says, order some. <laughs> this, this, is the day, this is the day after we're married. <laughs> I said, excuse me? She says, you've been eating my fries for way too long now. Order your own fries if you, if you want some fries. I said, okay. I'm seeing how things are shaping up, how things are shaping up here. <laughs> and, then, and then the other thing she straightened me out on, the, she, you know, you, I just, this is therapy for me. I got to share some stuff. This is, and, and she's not here at the moment, so y'all don't tell her. But she would sit beside me in the chair, and I'd put my hand, and my hand up on the headrest, and I'd just stroke the back of her hair. I love you, baby. Stroking the back of her hair. The day after we're married, I'm doing the same thing. And she says, you know what really bothers me? <laughs> I'm honest. This is the day after. Not the day of. This is the day after. <laughs> so if you could quit messing around with my hair, I'd really appreciate that. I said, okay, no fries, no hair. Where are we going with this, Deb? What? Hallelujah. But we're coming up on 35 years. It's all good. Come on. 35 years. It's all good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, I will be honest to say this. She eats off of my plate all the time. <laughs> I'm just telling you. It's not a two-way road. She, she eats my stuff all the time. And I don't say nothing about it. I, just, I, just, I don't say nothing about it. Order that chocolate milkshake. I'll take two straws, please. I, I know where that's going. Praise the Lord. The components of multiplication are simple. Seed, good ground. That's all it takes. Seed and good ground is all it takes 
Turn with me to Mark chapter 4, verse 20. But these are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word, accept it. Now we're talking, Jesus is defining what is good ground. And if you read the whole parable, you'd realize there's four types of soil. He's talking about the conditions of the heart. There's rocky, there's wayward, there's thorny. None of those are good habitations for the seed, which is the word of God. But seed is anything. Uh, We know from Galatians 9, whatever a man sows, whatever, you can make seed into anything. Well, good ground is those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. And now we're talking about superabundance, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And so good ground is is that ground that receives it receives it. There's a lot of people that will hear the Word of God and they will not receive the Word of God or everybody would be born again. There's a lot of people that hear the Word but they do not accept the Word and so that's not good ground. Y'all are good ground. You hear the Word, you accept the Word, you receive the Word, you believe the Word and you go about doing the Word and that makes you good ground. Well that's the definition of good ground. Good ground is the acceptable environment for receiving the Word of God, or receiving your seed, let me put it that way, for receiving your seed. And and let me just tell you this, whatever you put into the hand of Jesus, He will multiply, because that is good ground. We're going to see that in a moment. That is good ground. Matthew 25, verse 28. Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 25, verse 28. Now, this is a very interesting thing because Jesus is saying that if you're going to sow, you have to sow into good ground. Sowing into bad ground does not benefit your life. In fact, he says, he says, he says, I'm always looking for good ground to sow my blessings into. Matthew chapter 25, verse 28. So take the talent from him. This is the parable of the talents. You remember that the landlord gave various amounts of talents to his servants. One buried his talent, got no increase from his talent, didn't even get get interest on his talent, just buried his talent while the others multiplied their talents. And so Jesus came back and, and he said about the one that just buried his single talent. In verse 28, he said, take that talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Give him, give it to the good ground. Give it to the good ground. Verse 29, to everyone who has, more will be given. He will have an abundance. Everybody say an abundance. Abundance. He will have an abundance. Do you think Jesus is trying to get abundance into your life? Yes, he is. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Have you ever heard the phrase, use it or lose it? There it is, right there in Scripture. God gives you such rich blessings. Uh, Time, talent, treasures, giftings, anointings, callings. But you got to use it. And you got to say, Lord, I'm going to take the seed that you have sown into my heart, and I'm going to multiply it unto unto your return. I'm going to multiply what you have put into my life. Because Jesus said, if you're not going to use that, I can take what you've got and give it to somebody else who is using that Glory to God. And they'll have an abundance in their life. Hallelujah. Because it's all about seed and harvest. It's all about seed and harvest. Now, let's talk about the process of multiplication. The process of multiplication. And we see this in Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. Are we doing okay today? Matthew chapter 14, verse 14. And Jesus, and when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them, and healed their sick. Verse 15, when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, there is, uh, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy for themselves food. Send the multitudes away. Now, this is the progression of the law of multiplication. If you want to see the law of multiplication active in your life, you have to understand this progression. And here's number one, recognizing that there is a need. Look in verse 16. Look in verse 16. Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away, but you give them something to eat. 
the disciples said, there is a need, Lord, and that need is we're in a deserted place. There's so many people. Estimates were 5,000 men, maybe 25,000 people all together. They've been there all day. They, they had no food. The disciples' solution was send them away. Send them away. The disciples recognized that there was a need. And uh, that's a very easy thing for us to realize in our life. We recognize that we need more time. We recognize that we need more money. We recognize that we need more patience. We recognize that we need more joy. We need more peace. Do I need to keep on going? But the, the need in our life is easy to recognize. And then the second thing that we recognize is we lack the ability to meet that need. The, the disciples said, you know what? There is a need. There are 25,000 people that need to be fed, and we do not have the resources to do it. So they saw the need, they saw the lack, and they said, send them away. Usually we'll see our need, we'll see our lack, and then we'll kick the can down the road because we don't know what to do about it. But the law of multiplication has a strategy. Verse 16 again. Jesus said to them, you don't need to send them away. That's not the solution. He said, let's, let's pull on a spiritual law right now. He said, you give them something to eat. In other words, you're going to sow a seed. I'm going to teach you a spiritual law. You're going to do something that's going to change everything. You give them. And this is a, a great revelation. That when we see a need, uh, there, be, there comes a responsibility upon us. Either we need to pray about it, sow about it, give our time to it. We need to do something about it. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Of course, the disciples' response was, We do not have enough. In Matthew 4, 14 and 17, they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fishes. Uh, that's not going to cover feeding 25,000 people. Five loaves, two fishes, and if you read the Gospel of John, they didn't really have that. That was some little boy's lunch. They are going to take the little boy's lunch in, in John chapter 6, verse 9. There is a lad here who has five barley loaves. That's very coarse bread. That, that's not refined bread. Barley loaves was a coarse kind of bread. And two small fishes. It wasn't even, they didn't even say two fishes. They had to say two small fishes. It's like if two large fishes could possibly do it. They said, no, we haven't nearly got enough. What are they among so many? We just don't have enough. So here's, here's step one in the law of multiplication. is coming to the revelation of there's a need. I don't have the resources to meet that need. So I have a need. I have lack. What am I going to do about that? And Jesus said, you feed them. You do something about them. They said, they, they recited back to him, what do we got? We got five loaves, two fishes. How can that possibly meet the need. Here's step number two. Take what you do have and give it to Jesus. Take what, take what you got. It, it doesn't meet the need yet, but if you'll give it to Jesus, you'll see what He can do with that. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 18, He said, bring them here to me. And, and this, is the, this is the test. This is the test. Because in, in your flesh, you, you say, well, I've got so little for myself. How can that possibly meet the need of everybody else? So if I give that away, it's not going to meet their need, and I'm going to starve. So I'm going to hang on to it. And Jesus says, no, I want you to look at it differently. I, want, I don't want you to look at it as lunch anymore. I want you to look at it as seed. I, I don't want you to look at your lack anymore. I want you to look at it as seed. Yes, you do not own a grocery store. You cannot feed these 25,000 people. But if the law of sowing and reaping works, and if the law of multiplication works, what you do have is seed. And if that seed is sown, it will produce a harvest that will meet the need of more than just you. It will meet the need of the 25,000 that are here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You remember in 1 Kings chapter 17, 
Beginning in verse 11, Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. God sent Elijah, the prophet, to the widow of Zarephath. He said, Elijah, I've got a woman there that is going to take care of you. She's going to feed you, take care of your needs. When he got there, he saw that she was a poor widow woman. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 11. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Now God had told him this woman was going to meet his, his needs. And so he said to her, I'm hungry. Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And what she saw in return was meet your needs. I can't even meet my needs. So she saw the need, but she also saw her lack. And Elijah the prophet is going to get her to look at it a completely different way. Rather than looking at it as lack, he, was, she said, he said, I'm going to get you to look at it as seed. Uh, sow it into good ground. Let's keep reading in verse 12. So she said to him, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. See, she said, listen, I can tell you everything that I don't have. I don't have enough. I can tell you everything that I do have. It's just a little bit. It's not enough for everybody. Only a handful, only a little bit of oil. And I'm going to gather a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. <laughs> she said, this is my last meal. You want me to give you of my last meal. I haven't got any more beyond what's in my hand. Only a handful, only a little bit of oil. How can you possibly ask me to bring you bread? And this is what he said to her in verse 13. Don't fear. Get out of fear. Everybody say, get out of fear. Get, out of fear. get in faith. Get in. get in the law of multiplication. Yeah, he said, don't fear. Go and do as I have said. But make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and for your son. So he said, I want you to take what you have and sow a seed. Now, do, doesn't the Bible say, he who blesses the prophet will receive the prophet's reward? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Jesus said that. He says, make me a little cake first. Sow your seed. He said, you got to get some seed in the ground. You're making preparations to die. I'll turn it around for you. Sow that seed. Verse 14. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry. That sounds like super abundance to me. Every time you go into that bin to get flour, there's going to be flour in that bin. Every time you pour oil out of that jar, there's going to be oil in that jar. If you'll sow the seed, God will take care of you. God says, Those who bless you, I will bless. Glory to God. And so... He said, if you'll sow it, your bin of flour will not be used up, nor will the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. Hallelujah. Everybody say, hallelujah. hallelujah. That's super abundance. What's the revelation of that message? The revelation is, if you will sow the seed, uh, if you will look at what you have, you say, all I see is lack. No, what you have is seed. Uh, don't eat your seed. Don't eat your seed. Uh, you got to sow your seed. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. amen. Back to our text verse in Matthew 14. Here's step number three. When you take what you have and put it in the hand of Jesus, sow that seed. Take your five loaves, take your two fish, put it in the hand of Jesus, and let Jesus multiply your seed into a blessing. Matthew 14, verse 19. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down in the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed it. He broke it. That, that breaking part is the believing part. If I break this ble bread, it's going to produce more. So he blessed it. He broke it. And he gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave it to the multitudes. So he blessed it. He believed it. He broke it. And he gave it. When you... Put something in the hands of God, you can expect God to bless it. Hallelujah. You can expect God to give it back to you in a blessed state. Hallelujah. 
He's going to multiply that seed that you have given to him. Then number four, here's step number four. Faith says more than enough. Number three, putting the seed in the hands of Jesus. Giving it to Jesus for the blessing, for the breaking, and the giving back. And here's number four. Faith says more than enough. You'll see that in verse 20 of Matthew 14. So they all ate and were filled. They all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Was there more than enough? Yes. Was there leftovers? Yes. Leftovers are always the best, right? Yes. It, you remember Thanksgiving? You have your turkey, but the next day you get turkey sandwiches. Yes. And the next day you get turkey and, and, and uh, cranberry. Hallelujah. And the next day you get scrambled turkey. No, I don't know if you get that. But, <laughs> but um, the leftovers are always the best. Lasagna is always better the day after, right? That must be me. Glory to God. <laughs> and they all ate and were filled. Underline that word filled. Circle it in your Bible. I I've heard it preached before. Well, they took a little and they passed a little bit along. And as they went, it multiplied as they went. And everybody got just a little bit of a morsel here. And listen. If God's going to feed 25,000 people with five loaves of bread, it's not just a little bit of a dab is going to do you. He's going he's to fill your stomach. Because the Bible says they all ate and were filled. Nobody was asking for anybody more, any bit more. They, they were all full. They had as much as they could possibly eat. And not only were they filled, but there was leftovers. There were 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten, verse 21, those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides the women and the children. So the disciples said, we see the need. We don't have the supply to meet the need. Send them away. Jesus said, no, you meet the need. How can we possibly meet the need? We only have five loaves and, and two fishes. He said, okay, what you do have, give to me. Jesus took what they did have and gave to him, and he blessed it, he multiplied it, he returned it back to them. They then became a blessing. They were not a blessing before. They were sending the folks away. Jesus said, I'm going to bless you, you're going to be a blessing. He gave it back to the disciples so they could be a blessing. They then distributed it to all the people. All the people got everything that they could possibly eat, and there were 12 disciples distributing, and there were 12 baskets full picked up afterwards that is the law of multiplication yeah. hallelujah yeah. so the question is what what do I have to give to Jesus what do I have to give to Jesus it depends on how you look at what you have if if what you have is nothing more than stuff and things that's one thing that's lack does God want you to have stuff and things? Sure he does. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he'll supply all these things unto you. He doesn't mind you having things. He blessed Abraham with things. But if you look at what you have as things, that's one thing. But if you look at what you have as seed, seed, that's something else. Because if you have seed, then you have control over your harvest. And you simply have to have faith then for the law of multiplication to work. I'm going to take my seed and I'm going to put it in the hand of Jesus. I'm going to let Jesus bless that seed, turn it into a blessing back into my life so then I can be a blessing to those around me. Did, did you all hear what I just said? The law of multiplication recognizes this one point. Seed has one assignment and that is to multiply. A single seed produces a tree full of fruit a single seed has the law has one assignment and that is to multiply John chapter 12 verse 24 says most assuredly I say unto you unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies it remains alone but if it is sown if it dies if that grain he's talking about his own life now if that grain is sown Jesus said it produces much grain and that's us we're the much grain Jesus sowed his lives. We're the born-again lives of the harvest. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. John 15 and 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Bears much fruit. Bears much fruit. What are you saying, Pastor? This is what I'm saying this morning. God gives seed to the sower. We know that from last week in the law of sowing and reaping. It's God who gives seed to the sower. But sometimes when we look at the great need that may be in our lives, it, it feels overwhelming. And we look at our resources and they feel underwhelming. How can I possibly meet this need with what I have? And, and God says, will you just look at it a little bit differently? Will you look at what you have as seed? Seed is tiny little things, but they have the power of a harvest inside. Look at it as seed. Take that seed, five loaves, two fishes, and put it in my hands, says the Lord. I'm going to bless it. I'm going to bless your life with it, and your life is going to become a blessing to those around about you. Did you get anything out of this today? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise.